Hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you as ever from Vitality Stadium. We're here once again to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club and we might just have one of the biggest in the hot seat today. For those who are new to the podcast, my name's Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. Today, I'm once again in the company of Neil Perrett, my colleague who's an absolute encyclopedia of AFC Bournemouth knowledge. Now, Neil, we're gearing up to the Premier League again. It's going to be really exciting with less than a month to go now. Definitely getting very exciting fixtures out. Pre-season started. Everybody really looking forward to that first game. Going to be a cracking first game, going to be a cracking season. Going to be an odd one as well with such a big break in the middle for the for the World Cup. But uh, yeah, can't wait for it to start, Zoe. Well, before we get cracking, just a quick note to say that Vitality Stadium is very busy today. There's lots of people moving around the place, lots of noises. So apologies if you do hear a little bit of background noise. We will do our best to talk through it. But yes, apologies in advance if you do hear a couple of noises along the way. Anyway, moving on, we are spoiling you with today's guest and you're in for an absolute treat on our podcast. We sat with a man whose association with the football club goes back 30 years and he is undoubtedly a true club legend. Not only did he help us up the football pyramid, his goal saved the club during the great escape season of 2008-9. We've got plenty to go through, so without further ado, we're delighted to welcome Steve Fletcher onto the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Fletch, thanks for coming in. How are you and how's your summer going? Yes, it's been very good. I um, actually got away with a wife for the first time in about four years. Um, we have four dogs, four sharpies, who we adore as my daughters have got older. Um, the dogs have replaced uh, the children. Um, so it was nice to get away. We had uh, five or six days in Dubai. Um, went away with, with my friends like I usually do to Mallorca. Um, it's usually Marbella, but I changed it up this year. And just little, little trips away here and there. The family's got a lodge down in Devon, so we went there for a week with family and friends. It was lovely. Um, it was just nice to relax, spend some time in my garden. That's my hobby. Um, but as you know, those six, seven weeks we have off just fly past. But it looks fabulous right at the beginning after the last game, but in the blink of an eye, it's all over. And then you've got 10 and a half months where you don't really get much more time off. I know we have the World Cup. As, as Neil has alluded to, but apart from that, um, you can't really plan too much. So you've got to pack everything into them the six, seven weeks that you actually have off. And, you know, it's the first time we've had a, a, a huge break like this because with the pandemic, we had two weeks. Then the playoff semi final, um, we had two weeks less. And first time we've really had a big chunk of time. So it's been fabulous. Well, that's fantastic to hear. Now we've got plenty to get through today. Um, so we're going to get straight to it. We're going to go right back to the start, July 1992. You became Tony Pulis's first signing as a manager when you joined from Hartlepool. Just talk us through that move. Yeah, I actually like that, actually, because Tony Pulis went on to be a, a fabulous manager. I mean, you know, renowned throughout of England, Europe even. Um, and to be his first ever signing as, as a manager is, is very nice. I just went into pre-season at Hartlepool, um, into training. It was... I think it was the 20, 22nd of July. Um, I was 19. Went into training, got called by the manager into the room. I had a bit of a panic up thinking I'd done something wrong. And he just said to me, look, Bournemouth have come in with an interest for you. Would you, would you like to go down and, and see what they're about? Um, actually, God's honest truth, being 19 and you know, a little bit naive, I, I didn't know where Bournemouth was exactly in the country. Um, and then realized it was 300 and 40 miles away. So I phoned my parents. Um, I didn't fancy driving that distance by myself, so there was no mobile phones. Everything was on a road map. So we looked at the route we were going to take, and I I set off midday with my dad and got down here about 6 o'clock. I phoned Tony just outside of Ringwood on my way here, and he guided me in through the West Cliff, I think strategically, because he knew how picturesque it was and obviously the opposite of what Hartlepool's like. Um, the sun was blaring down and I remember looking at my dad thinking, oh, wow, this is, <laughs> this is a different world. Um, put us up in the, in the Royal Bath Hotel, which at the time was five star overlooking the, the beach near the pier. It was amazing and sent us to a lovely restaurant. And I've never been looked after like that in football. So he definitely set, <laughs> he set, the, um, he set the tone for, for what would be a, an amazing time I've had here in 30 years. And 
the day after I met Tony and we took us to the training ground, came to the stadium and I literally signed on the 23rd of July, uh, if, if my maths do right. Um, 30 years later, here we are and you never see past one season, never mind 30, but a lot's happened personally and, and on the football field and off the football field really. Um, but that's how, that's how it came about and yeah, I'd had two years as apprentice, apprentice at Hartlepool, uh, two years as a pro. So this was my third year as a, as a professional and instead of sat, starting it in the, the northeast of England, I started it on the south coast here in Bournemouth. S Steve, you scored on your home debut against Port Vale, but you only managed four goals in your first season. Like you said, you're only 20, very young. You took a little bit of stick in those early days, it's fair to say. What was that like trying to deal with that? Yeah, at the time it was tough because I come in and... I know you had a striker called Jimmy Quinn, obviously he came and managed the club and I've, I've got to meet Jimmy a lot over the years. And he was a prolific goal scorer and he was sold. Um, I think the fans thought Tony had bought myself to come in and replace him. But the two seasons I had at Hartlepool, I was predominantly a substitute anyway. It was only towards the end of my second season where Tony saw me play. Ironically, the last game of the season, when it was Harry's last game away, away at Hartlepool, I played. Um, I think Paul Morell and... Kevin Bond with the centre half, so I had a really good game. And I think that's when Tony looked at me and thought, I'll have a bit of that. Um, so yeah, it was tough. I got a bad injury with my knee and it's plagued me ever since. And it's the knee I've had 11 ops on over my career. Um, I injured part of um, my ACL, only 10%. And no disrespect to anyone at the time, but back then the treatment wasn't very good. I'm, I'm not making any excuses, but I never got back fit. I never felt I was 100% fit. I always went out in the field thinking something was wrong inside of my knee. Um, as it was later on in my career, it did plague me uh, in my late 20s, early 30s. But So it was a stop start. Like you say, I got off to a great start at, at home. First home game scored against Port Vale. We won 2-1. Um, got another goal away, maybe at Mansfield, I don't know. And then, then I hit the injury. I was playing with F and Akuku at the time. Came back way too quick. Looking back now, you know, it was, a, it was terrible to come back as early as I did. And I just never felt right till the end of the season. And like you say, I only got four goals. The fans were on my case a little bit. I was low in confidence. <laughs> Being away from home, and I know a lot of young lads travel around now, but it wasn't really a, a thing that many people did back in the day. There was no mobile phones. Couldn't phone my parents when I had a bad day. I was getting steak or, you know, you're feeling low. I was in digs. I had to ask to use the, the telephone. Um, from my landlady. Um, it was a lonely place. It was. A, a, I was um and ah whether I'd done the right thing and uh, it wasn't until the next season or two seasons later that I actually was thinking about maybe it's time for me to leave and that was when Tony left and Mel Machen came in. We'll get to that but yeah, it was, it was a tough first season um, when you were 19 when you signed just before my 20th birthday to come in and the expectations were really high and like I say, I hadn't really started that many games from Hartlepool. I, I think I maybe started maybe 10 or 12 and was substitute maybe 25 times came on, but that was my only experience before I came here. We will get to that. We'll get to that now. That is the next question. You quickly won over the fans and you were crowned player of the season in 94, 95. And for those of us old enough to remember, that was the original great escape season before the greatest escape season. Now, Certainly an eventful season. Give us your recollections of that one. Yeah, well, Tony had left. Um, we didn't really have a... Well, we didn't have a manager. So I think it was, it was a mixture of um, Mark Morris, the captain, Sean O'Driscoll and, and John Williams. Um, they took a few games. Um, I was playing centre-half because we had so many injuries. Um, we were bottom of the league. Rock bottom. We were getting thumped at home three and four every week. Um, we had a young team um, and it was tough. And then Mel came in, Mel Machen, and I stayed at centre half for a couple of games. And then I got injured. And on Boxing Day, I believe, or I think it was round about Christmas, I think it was Boxing Day, I came back from injury and he put me up front. He said, I don't want to play centre half anymore. I want you up front. And we had 10 points, I think, at Christmas, way adrift of anywhere. And um, nine points. Neil's pointing to me nine points. Okay, nine points at Christmas. I mean, we were miles away from we were everyone's favourite to go down. You would be with nine points halfway through the season. 
And I went up front, I scored two goals on Boxing Day, I believe, against Swansea at home. We won 3-2. And from then till the end of the season, it, it was just a whirlwind. I think we signed people like, well, Matty Holland, although Matty didn't play a lot in that, in that first six months. Obviously, went on to be fabulous after that. But we had Steve Jones. I played up top with him. Uh, Jason Brissett, Steve Robinson, Neil Young, John Bailey. We signed all these players and um, had such a young team. And I think we were just fearless. And we went on a run. And I believe if we'd have started the, started the campaign at Christmas, we'd have, we'd have got promoted. We had that many. I think we were, we were second only behind Birmingham on the amount of points we... Uh, accumulated from Christmas up until the end of the season and we stayed up on the on the last game uh, it was fabulous at home we beat Brentford away who were pushing for promotion they were in the top two we beat them away 2-1 on the Saturday Scott Mean and Steve Jones got the goal got the goals and now uh, I think we played um, Shrewsbury at home on a Monday or Tuesday night um, strangely I think the game was played because of the trouble that had been here a couple of years previous with Leeds I know I think the last game was on a bank holiday so they'd pushed our game four or five days early um, and we were 3-0 up in about 20 minutes the game was done and dusted and it was an amazing feeling and um, I got support as player of the season that season it was incredible to think the previous two years I'd thought about leaving when, Ma well, when Mel Machen came in almost was going to go to his office and say look Mel I don't think it's happening for me here for whatever reason and and it just changed, and I, I put it down to that one game at home against Swansea. Scored two goals, and it gave me confidence. The team was flowing, and, it, and it's funny how things can turn around in, in the blink of an eye. And in, and in one game, people say, your season can change in one game. I think my career did. Steve, the club's parlous financial state came home to roost when the receivers were called in during the 96-97 season. The begging bowls came out at the Winter Gardens, a really uncertain time. What's your recollection of that time? Well, I know exactly what was happening. My wife was pregnant and we were trying to get a mortgage, trying to get a little house together and uh, nobody would give me a mortgage. And it wasn't just me, there was another couple of lads. Um, I remember um, Rob Murray, who was in the same situation. His, his missus was pregnant. Um, but none of us could get a mortgage because the club wasn't secure, so nobody could sign the deeds. Um, it, it was horrible. I was, we were sat here, didn't know whether we could train, whether we could play, and, and everybody knows we didn't. We didn't get paid, and we get we get a lot of plaudits for playing through that period where we weren't paid for a couple of months. I don't think that really entered the players' minds. I never, I can't recollect a meeting where all the players got together and said, "Right, if they don't pay us, we're not going to play." I don't think that that was the be all and end all. Of course, we needed it, and we were all pushing our when we did get little bits and bobs of wages. We were, sometimes it was coming in in cash in your hand and a quarter of your wages here and there and then you'd pay a few bills off but you'd have to phone your mortgage company you'd have to phone your mobile phone company up you'd have to phone all, all your bills you were paying and say can you can you put my direct debits back nobody could afford to pay them because you you know we went on a lot of money back then it was literally you pay your bills you might have a little bit extra for a, a night out and maybe a holiday at the end of the season but that was it so there were tough times and we stuck together. I think that was the most important thing. I think that's why the fans l loved us the way they did because we never downed tools. In fact, if anything, it galvanized the team. And I remember the Winter Gardens and the speeches and walking in and the supporters, and I think we were all overwhelmed. I've seen the videos, and I still see them to this day. They're always put out on social media. The club put a lot out. Um, and how that, how that team responded from what we saw at the Winter Gardens will always stick with me because... I think without that, you don't feel part of a football club. It needs something like that to bring you together. And I was like, I remember just feeling, you know, I, I want to be part of this. It, it's amazing. I don't want to leave this club. Look at these supporters. It means everything to them. You've seen people there who haven't got a penny to scratch together, putting every last drop they've got into a bucket. It's almost, you're in tears thinking about it now. And at the time, you were just overwhelmed. But it's only when I look back now, it's, it's just it's incredible. Um, and the club got saved at the last minute. Got my little house, signed the mortgage actually on the same day. I took the papers into Trevor Watkins, who was obviously um, the senior member of the um, committee who was keeping the club alive. Um, I made him sign the papers so I could literally, I was like, I was two or three days away from not getting this little house in Throop where, I, where we had for two years. Um, and it all worked out fantastic in the end. But yeah, it was tough times for everyone. and. 
to think that we could have lost the football club. We, we weren't far away. I know it, it's happened a lot and we've seen it with some clubs over the, over the years. But we were literally minutes away from, you know, going into liquidation and God knows what would happen, whether we would have capitulated or would have had to start again from so many leagues below, I don't know. Now, the following season, you had a trip to Wembley in the final of the Auto Windscreen Shield. Just tell us about that, the build-up, the game, perhaps a little bit about your solo and staying alive. Well, I know we got a free trip to Chicago out of it, which is brilliant at the end of it. I think the club made a lot of money and they rewarded the players with a trip to Milwaukee and Chicago at the end of the season. And that was fabulous. Um, yeah, we got through the early rounds and it was one of them cup competitions that doesn't really grip you until you get to maybe the quarterfinals. And then we got the quarterfinals. I think we, we got through against, uh, I can't remember. Neil's going to tell me in a minute. No, OK. We played Walsall in the, in the in this semi-final. We always played Bristol City in cups in those days. I think we might yeah, have played there. Maybe in Bristol, but we got to the, we got to the semi-final. And um, if my mind has me right, I think we won 2-0 away at Walsall. Russell Beardsmore got a goal from a corner. I flicked it on. Russell Beardsmore got two, I'm being told. OK, so we went into the second leg, 2-0 up. And, and it, it's a precarious position to be in because you're thinking, we just hold on to what we've got. There's a trip to Wembley. Probably majority of us had never played there, and I hadn't. It was the old Wembley. It was something he dreamed of walking out the Wembley, the Wembley tunnel onto the pitch as, as a child. Um, and I remember coming in the game and we went 1-0 down, 2-0 <laughs> down. You're like, oh my God, here we go. And then out of nowhere, up pops... Um, Frank Rowling, centre half. I remember the cross came in. I think it was John Bailey put a cross in. I, I was going to hit it and I saw Frank and it was on my right foot, but it was behind me and I thought, well, I'd have to take a touch. And, and Frank shouted, Frank's or something, whatever. And I jumped over the ball, I dummied it. So like lifted myself over the ball and Frank just hit this shot in. And we went in and we ended up getting through and it was amazing. I remember going at the change room. We lost the game, but we'd won an aggregate. And to think we were going to go to Wembley. But you know what? Ne it nearly never happened for me. And I haven't really spoke about this. I got injured two weeks before I pulled my hamstring. I hadn't done it too bad. And I pulled my hamstring. I just couldn't believe it. And ironically, we, we, had to, we, we were playing Walsall in the league, the team where we'd beat in the semi-final, the week before. And I went down to Mel Machen's office. And I said to him, um, and I tell you who else went down when he was injured as well, Frank Rowland. Cause, and I always wind Eddie up about this, Eddie Hell, because he came in and played in the final ahead of Frank. So we went out to see Mel Machen, me and Frank, with the physio, and he said, look, Fletcher's struggling with his hamstring. I'd, he doesn't want to play against Walsall in the league because he wants to save himself for the final. And Frank was the same. So both our injuries weren't too bad, but we didn't want to risk it. And Mel was like, mm, I need you to play, son, you know. I want you to play. I need to know you're fit. And I was like, oh, I'm good enough to play. You'd have strapped it up. And I got through the game. I actually scored and we won 1-0. So I played Frank. Didn't want to risk his injury. He took a gamble on Mel choosing him. Eddie came in for that game against Walsall in the league. Done really well. Mel kept the same team in the final. And Frank never played. And there was quite a bit of controversy about it with the supporters because he'd scored about three or four goals in the competition and obviously the goal that got us to the final. And um, when I wind Eddie up about it, he said, well, he should have played against Walsall in the league, shouldn't he? He said, it's not my fault. I had a great game. And the, you know, I mean, Mel loved Eddie anyway, but um, Eddie played instead. Um, I know we lost the final. It was devastating. But to, to walk out and the Wembley Tunnel and 67,000 supporters there, I think we took 33,000. It was just incredible. And it was one of the, biggest highlights of my career. I know we lost on Golden Goal, uh, but we did take the lead. I had a, a little bit of a part in it. I flicked it on and um, Max Dean, I think, tried to take it around the keeper and the keeper scooped it out and John Bailey knocked it in. Um, so, yeah, it was that was a great moment because we took the lead and we lost the game. But, you know, when you play in a final, if you lose and it's a cup competition, it's very, very disappointing. Of course it is. But, I've played in a final, obviously, later on in my career where the whole season depends on it, and I think that's a different ballgame. Now, the playoffs, they continued to elude the Cherries, and I'm more so in 2000 to 2001, obviously, Jermaine Defoe season. Were you ever tempted to seek pastures new and perhaps seek a move to the Championship? Or I, had, I had a lot of offers, yes. Um, it, was, it, it was publicly known that uh, Queen's Park Rangers 
uh, wanted me. They were they were in the championship. Obviously, I think it was I don't know if it was League One or League Two at the time, and they kept changing names every other year. Um, Jerry Francis was the manager. Uh, I did I did have a chat with Jerry. Um, as other clubs came in, Preston, Burnley, they were in the they were in the championship, but Luton was another one. They were in the championship, but we were flying high in League One and seen players leave and the grass isn't always green it but the most important thing that I wanted to stay was because I was happy and of course you always think what if what if I mean looking back now I'd never change it for the world and I wouldn't have experienced anything that I've experienced since then uh, and some amazing amazing uh, moments in my life not just not just in my football career but I was happy and my wife was happy and I spoke to Mel Mitch and he said look I'd like you to stay club want you to stay and I made a decision practically on the spot I said well I'm not interested I don't want to leave I, I had no reason to leave listen if I was unhappy and maybe if it had come after them two first two years when I was here then maybe that would have been a different story but I was loving life I was loving my football we were flying high a great team around us uh, and it's a travesty we didn't go up because that team deserved to go up we started off bottom of the league and we worked our way all the way up and then 10 minutes from the end we were sucker punched and drew the game 3-3 after being 3-1 up. I just, um, we were devastated. And then in the last minute, I remember Stephen Purchase hit a shot and looped over the keeper and it was going in and the lad cleared it off the line. We still to this day thought it was over the line and that was in the, like, the 94th minute after Redding had equalised to make it 3-3. But yeah, I remember after the game, I was cuddling Richard Hughes. He was crying. We're all in tears in the, in the change and we believed we were going to go to Redding, beat them and um, getting the playoffs and hopefully progressing to the, the second tier of English football. But like you said, it eluded us on so many occasions and we were always the Neely and I felt like I was the Neely man. I nearly, I nearly got promotion, I nearly got a hat-trick, I nearly did this, I nearly did that and it was another disappointment at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, you were injured for most of the 2001-2 relegation season, but... You did score in the playoff final against Lincoln in 2002-2003 season. Just sum up those two those two years from your point of view. Um, horrendous turning into euphoria, really, because I'd got injured in pre-season. Literally jumped for a header in training, went down, my knee collapsed. I was like, that doesn't feel right. Obviously, I'd had knee problems before, like I said to, to you earlier, earlier on in my first season. With, with my cruciate not being right, et cetera, et cetera. And it was just giving way on me. And Sean O'Driscoll was the manager and he, we went to see a specialist uh, up in Leeds. He said, oh, I'll just give you a little clean out, trim the cartilage like you do. Back in the day, you wouldn't dream of doing it now, but came out, it's like, okay, I think I played a cup game here at home against maybe walking, um, scored. Played the next game away at Chesterfield in the league. Half time I had to come off, I said, I felt my knee again. So I went up to see the specialist again, had a look in, did another clean up, came back training, wasn't right. Went to see another specialist this time in Sheffield. So this is the third specialist. He found the area that was actually, well, the problem was I had, a, I had a chondral defect. It's what um, Alan Shearer, Jimmy Redknapp and a few other players uh, have had problems with and ended their career. It's basically a hole in your bone and it was at the bottom of my femur. It, it, it's, it, it just creates like a, a, a crevice in your bone. And he found it, or his, his um, the person who reads the scans, he found it straight away. So they went in and did the operation because obviously the two operations I had before that with the person in Leeds, he didn't see it for some bizarre reason. So this was like January now. So I'd waited like five months, I'd wasted. Did the operation, give me the rehab. I got better rehab. Um, there's a person in America who all the bigger players used to go and see called Stedman. He was very famous. He did a lot of the American players as well. And he was renowned for getting players back from this type of injury. Um, so I got the rehab from him, from a friend. Um, did a lot of it by myself. It was very lonely. Got to about May and I didn't feel right. And that's, I was, this is, it doesn't feel right. It's been three months now. My knees, it's still not right. Obviously hadn't played. So I went and seen a different specialist. Somebody said, well, there's somebody else in North Wales. So I went to Oswestry in North Wales, seen this specialist called Diaries, who had this type of injury before and had got, apparently got people back playing. Um, 
Went to see him, showed him the scans, looked at it. He said, right, I'll do the op. We pencil it in for June. So a month later, or a couple of weeks later. I was like, here we go again. Because um, I said it didn't feel right. Went back in June, came out of the anesthetic after he'd done the op. And he said to me, I'd be like in a splint and I couldn't feel anything. And I didn't do anything from, <laughs> when I went to see him, in the middle of May till, I don't know what it was, the middle of June, the three or four weeks. And it started to heal. He said, I, I don't want to touch it. It's actually healing really nice. And I was like, well, that's bizarre because I actually haven't done any rehab. I thought, well, if I'm coming to see you in three or four weeks, what's the point of me doing the rehab and aggravating it? Um, I'm just going to do nothing. And he said, I don't know what's happened, Fletch. He said, but in them three or four weeks since I last seen you, it started to heal and I don't want to touch it. He said, I've done nothing to it. He, get, he said, carry on with your rehab, slowly do it. And I came back and I was back playing in October. I mean, it's bizarre, isn't it? Because that injury back in the day was in nine months to a year out. And I'd had a long time, but from having the op in January to not feeling right, to then him looking at it and saying, yeah, we'll, we'll do a, the op again, but it'll be your last chance saloon. I mean, it was literally, I told like, this, this is your last chance. So I was 29, 30, I think. And then bizarrely, I came back. I mean, my game changed a lot. I could, I still had to be careful, man. He, I had a lot of swelling. He said to me, look, you ain't going to be able to do what you did. He said, you might get another couple of years playing. I ended up having another 10 or 11. So I did change my game. I went in the gym. I got bigger and stronger. I, I, I couldn't twist and turn a lot because my knee would, would lock and I was worried about aggravating again. Um, I was taking too many painkillers and all that. I took a lot of Voltarol to, to hide the pain. I got told off later in life. Um, from a specialist that had been on it too long and had to stop. But yes, it was a, it was a terrifying time. And then to come back in the October, um, we played away at Lincoln. Ironically, the team we beat in the in the playoff final. Um, I came on a sub. We won the game two one or one nil. I know we won the game. Stephen Perch has scored a, a cracking volley from twenty five yards from a corner. It might have been one nil. And I slowly got myself back in the team and played a massive part. And then we got to Wembley. And um, I was just sick of being the Neely man, like I said earlier. I was sick of Neely doing this, Neely doing that. And um, I just remember before the game, I was so pumped up. I remember I've got seen the video and I'm shaking hands with the, with the royalty or the people who come out beforehand. And I nearly broke his hand, I think, in the handshake. I thought, there's no way I'm getting beat in this game. I'm just sick of not being, not being successful, not, not achieving what I want to achieve. And, Scored the first goal, it was an incredible feeling. I flicked on from uh, Marcus Brown and I just gambled and hit a cracking volley. Passed the keeper, ran off to my family and friends who were all in the second tier. I knew where they were and blew them a kiss and all the players jumped on me and it was an amazing feeling. And we won the game 5-2, Carl Fletcher getting two. Uh, Carl O'Connor and, uh, and Perchy. It was, it was fabulous and to actually feel, feel that euphoria of, of winning and achieving something and not being second best again was, was, was magnificent. And I would say it's probably my second most favorite moment in the history of my footballing career. Couple of near misses after that, 03, 04, 04, 05. The Cherries just couldn't quite make that leap into the championship. You've named some of those players already. Carl Fletcher, Richard Hughes, Wade Elliott, Gareth O'Connor all went on to play Championship and Premier League. Do you think that squad underachieved at the time? 100%. 100%. And it wasn't just that squad. We had a couple of squads where we missed out on the last day. Um, but yeah, you look at them players and where they went on and, and where they went and what they went on to achieve was incredible. Um, you couldn't foresee it at the time, but looking back now, you go, yeah, of course. Carl Fletcher had so much quality. He was a leader. Went on to play for Wales, went to West Ham, fabulous career, Wade Elliott. These players you talk about, Richard Hughes, it was, you could see it, you could see it afterwards, but maybe not at the time when you're in among it, because they're just part of your gang, really. The, the group of lads you're going out with every day, you're training with every day, you're playing with every Saturday and Tuesday. Um, massively underachieved. But like I said, that, that was probably the case in maybe two or three teams, but especially that team. When I look at that team now on paper, you think we should have easily been promoted and myself experience and, Championship football, which is obviously one of the things that really haunts me and plays on my mind. I never actually got to play at the second level of English football. And really, that, that is a, a travesty, really. I mean, Eddie used to say to me afterwards, the manager, Eddie Howe, 
when I'd retired, he said, Fletch, how the hell did you not play? Second, second level, he said, he said, I blame you, actually, and he's right. I should, I blame myself a lot. Um, I don't really want to go into that, but I blame myself a lot. He said, that there's no way that you should not have played at that level. Um, I just said to him, well, I didn't have you as manager back then, did I? So you couldn't coach me, but yeah, it, it's something that does play on my mind and everyone said, oh, you got promoted to the championship. I said, yeah, and then I retired. <laughs> so I never actually got to do it. One man you did have uh, as a manager was Kevin Bond. He came in to replace Sean O'Driscoll and that coincided eventually with you leaving the club and, and, and joining Chesterfield. That must have been a tough one for you. It was, yes. Um, I'd been at the club 15 years. So it was 2007. I thought I was going in for Kevin to say, yeah, we'll obviously give you another year. We've got Sam Vokes coming through. You can nurture him, help him, guide him, which I had done for about six months. And Sam, do you know what's nice about it? When you hear ex-players like Sam and other players have said, you know what? Fletch taught me how to head the ball, blah, blah, blah. And it's nice because he went on to have a fabulous career as well. And every time I see him in town or he puts his arm around me and goes, I would never have been able to head the ball unless you took me on them sessions. And that was just me as a player. And, you know, I hoped I was going to get another year. As it was, I walked out of Kevin Bond's office after about five minutes and went home and said to my wife, I'm, I ain't got a club. I'm, they're not taking me on. And she just looked at me disillusioned and shed a few tears. Within about an hour, the news had filtered through and the fans set up a, a website in honour of myself with, with testimonials and, and thank yous. And, and I think I got over 750 messages from people and majority of them I would say were not even football related and you forget what you, you've done in 15 years and I was just sat reading them with the wife and I phoned my parents up. I said, have you seen this site? And um, people were saying how I'd gone to a hospital to see their child and who'd had an accident and I was her inspiration from, I mean, you can't compare it, but you don't realize how many lives and people you've touched. And the, and the little things you just do, because I am a good person. I want to do good things. I like to represent the club. I always had time for people. If, if a lad come up to me and said, can you come and see my grandma? She's not very well in the hospital. I'd go down. I'd do it because that's the way I've been brought up in my life from my parents. And that's the way I was as a human being. But you don't understand the impact you've made until people tell you what you've done. And it might have been just going to a school. It might have been just doing a speech at a ceremony. It might have been going to someone's wedding. It might have been doing a video for someone... And then obviously everything I'd done on the pitch for the club and I just was in tears for about three or four hours and the messages kept come rolling in. So I printed every single one off because I want to show my children when I'm older. My children were only like 10 and, 10 and 7 then. And I printed every one of the 700 and odd messages off just to show them later in life. Your dad didn't do too bad. I mean, as it was, I was going to come back. I didn't know that at the time. I thought that was the end of my, you know, association with the cherries. But... Yeah, it was a sad time. And then I was very, very proud when I read them messages of, of what I'd achieved. And within a day, I had um, the manager of Chesterfield phone me up, uh, Lee Richardson, and said, look, I'd like you to come up. And I was thinking, oh, I don't want to travel to Chesterfield. My wife said, I'm not leaving Bournemouth. She's a Bournemouth girl. And I said to him, oh, mate, it's a long way. You know, it's, I think it was about 230 miles. I had a couple of other clubs sniffing. I was 34 four at the time, coming up 35, so it would have been, yeah, and my birthday's in July, so I think it was May, so it was May 2007, yeah, it was coming up 35, and I was thinking, well, I'll wait, and I'll wait, and then people were saying to me, if you wait too long, you know, the ship might sail, and my wife said to me, she said, why don't you just go up and see Lee Richardson, see what he has to say, and I went up and he said, look, Fletch, he said, I understand your situation, blah, 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 you don't have to come in every day, I'll let you have a couple of days at home, come in on a Thursday ready for a game on a Saturday and then you know if we've got a midweek game stay up and then go back and he was he was amazing with me and and it worked and um I had a year at Chesterfield uh, it was a fabulous year I got on really well with the supporters they loved me because I spent time with them again and, and talked to them and I remember a couple of supporters coming up to me and said we spoke more to you Fletch in one year than we have some of the some of the players in four or five and I, I left after one season and I still have the supporters. When I, every time I played up at Chesterfield, they'd sang my name. It was incredible. Um, we even played Chesterfield on the last ever game at Saltergate. And this is a memory that sticks with me. And it's actually on, it's on YouTube. And right at the end of the game, I ran up the stairs to the Bournemouth supporters because I promised to get a lady my shirt. 
and uh, all the Chesterfield supporters ran on the pitch. Um, they'd scored a last minute winner to beat us 2 1 on the last ever game at Saltergate. Um, and they saw me in the stand and thousands started singing my name. My parents were there, my dad was nearly in tears. And, you know, he was writing emotional. I think it's only a little thing, but it means so much to me. And they could have sang anyone's name, they could have sang a song about Chesterfield, and they saw me in the stand and they had thousands of people on the pitch singing my name. Chesterfield supporters. So I, I must have touched the hearts a little bit, and that's quite endearing. It's, it's nice to think I'd done that. Um, and then I went to Crawley after that for, for six months under Steve Evans. And then a certain Mr. Howe got the job at Bournemouth, and the next thing I'm on the, on the phone to him, and we're discussing about myself coming back, which at the time I, I just laughed off. But it was, it was a very strange, very strange moment uh, as it happened. Steve Evans is obviously quite an interesting character. We've all seen him on the touchline and stuff like that. And I think you owe him a real debt of gratitude, I believe, for that Crawley move back to Bournemouth. I do. And do you know what? Every time I see Eddie and we speak about it, um, he says to me, I still, I still need to buy Steve Evans a drink, he said, because I never thanked him. Because I was six months into my contract and I'd signed a two-year contract to Crawley. And we were flying high in the, the Blue Square Prem or wherever it was back then. Um... First time Crawley had been up near the top end was a chance we could get promoted. And then I was on the phone to Eddie a day after he got the job and I was congratulating him, blah, blah, blah. And then we talked about me coming back and we just laughed it off. And then Eddie just changed his tone on the, on the phone and he went, no, I'm being serious. And I was like, no, don't do that to me, Ed. No, 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 mate. You don't need me coming back. I'm 36 and a half years of age. You don't want me coming back. No, mate, come on. So this was like January after he just got the job. I think he got the job on like January the might be the first or New Year's Eve, yeah, January the first. And I spoke to him on the second. And um, it's funny because my wife said to me, I bet Eddie phoned you and you speak to Ed about it. And I was like, no, 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 I'm a crawler. He won't want, doesn't want nothing to do with me. And then we spoke and and a couple of days later, we spoke again and he said, I'm being truthful. I want you back. I want you to come back. I want you to run the changing room. I don't expect you to play every game. I understand your situation. But I want you back. And I said, well, mate, I'm come on, I'm six months into a contract, I've got 18 months. He said, well, go and see Steve Evans. I was like, have you ever met Steve Evans? You know what he's like? And he was great with me because I was older, but he can be brutal and, you know, I, and he's brilliant and I love him to bits. And I've spoken to a lot of players who played under him and he's definitely my mate. You either love him or you hate him. And um, he's quite a character which we've seen over the years. And it was getting towards deadline in January and Ed, Ed's me early years and all the time he's going I need to know Fletch I need to know because if I can't get you I'm going to have to go and get someone else and this is like I'm keeping it a secret and I can't go and see Steve and I kept bottling it and then one day Ed just went to me I need to know yes or no basically I went to see Steve Evans in the in the manager's room at Crawley because we trained at the stadium um, and I got a bit of confidence I thought right, I'm going to go and see him I have to Ed needs to know today so I went to the office and he's in his office by himself and he's on the computer blah 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 and I put my head around the corner and my heart sank and I walked away, <laughs> couldn't do it. And I sat around the corner of the manager's office for about two minutes thinking, can't do it, can I do it, can't do it, I've got to do it. And I was talking to myself, I was like, and then it, it just come over me and I walked in the office and he put his laptop down and he went, yes, Fletch, what's the matter, mate? And I went, Steve, I need a chat with you. And honestly, it's like he knew and he went, you want to go back to Bournemouth? And I went, has Eddie phoned you? He went, no, should he have? And I went, no. No, I panicked. I went, no. And he went, is it you want to go back to Bournemouth? I went, well, the thing is, Steve, <laughs> I says, if it was any other club but Bournemouth, I wouldn't be in your office right now. You know that. He said, Fletch, if it was any club apart from Bournemouth, I wouldn't have you in my office. He said, uh, do you really want to go back? I said, if it wasn't Eddie Howe's manager, I said, probably wouldn't have even dreamed of it. I said, but Eddie has obviously spoke to me asked me if I was interested and I said, I, I keep waking up at night thinking about it. Everyone's telling me to maybe go for it. And then other people saying, don't go for it because you had 15 years, don't go and spoil what you had. He said, you know the situation they're at the club, don't you? The 10 points adrift, you know, did that, you know that 21 point deducted, uh, minus 17, 21, minus 17. Um, I was like, yeah, I understand the situation. He said, well, look, give me till the end of the day. If I can find a striker to replace you, I'll let you go. And he phoned me late that evening. He said, I've got a lad from Salisbury, big lad called Matthews. He said, because I know how much Bournemouth means to you, I'll let you go. Phoned Eddie. He said, right, come in the next day. Came in, signed the forms with Neil Vacher. 
it was obviously because of the situation the club was in there was no one around we had about three people working Neil Virtue doing the job of about 10 men or women um, JT and, and Eddie and um, I remember I had, a, I had a bit of a thigh strain because I said to Ed at the time I said I've got a bit of a thigh strain I've been, I've been on the bench for Crawley the last couple of games he said well can you train because we've got Wickham tomorrow and Wickham are top of the league I said I want to yeah I said I'll see how it is so I went to see the physio after I'd signed the forms here to sign, sign again for Bournemouth and I was getting my thigh strapped up and Eddie was grabbing me off the bench come on we've got to train we've got to train we were training on the pitch when I got out there he got the players to do a guard of honour for me which was a lovely touch and I joked around I come out and I pretended to clap the fans and uh, I've got it on video it's a, it's a lovely little moment and then the next day we played Wickham full house 6,000 I think I think the previous crowd was about three it was Eddie's first game as manager back at home I think the two games he'd had before that was Rotherham away Darlington away lost them both so it was Eddie's first game I'd come back <laughs> we went one nil down after about three minutes I think the goalkeeper had uh, tried to take it around the striker lost it and he bundled it in I think it was Matt Harold uh, for Wickham and I walked back to the halfway line thinking oh my god what is going on here and then Brett struck a 30-yard free kick into the top corner and we equalised and the whole place just erupted. And then we, uh, PSE got a header from a corner. We went 2-1. And then I think Jake Thompson got a deflected goal to make it 3-1 in the second half. And I remember afterwards, the whole place just was bouncing. Eddie for me on the night, he said, Biggin, I can't believe just what went on there. He said, it's been unbelievable. And we just went on this run. I mean, there was a lot of blips along the way. And we all know, obviously, what happened right at the end um, against Grimsby. But it was just an amazing time. I think I signed on the 23rd of something like 21st, 23rd of January. There was 19 games to go. And I played in every one bar one, uh, which I did come on as sub anyway. It was Barnet away. I think it was the Bank Holiday where there was a game on the Saturday and the Monday and I couldn't play two, two games in, in the space of three days. And that was the only game I missed. As a, as, a, as a starter um, it was incredible but it all went down to the Grimsby game every time we, we got our head above water we'd, we'd sink back down below it and we looked at Grimsby and they were down in the same position as us and everybody thought we'd, we'd be safe by then but as it was we went and it all went down to the Grimsby game the next season we just literally had the same team and we went on this great start we kept the good feel factor the team spirit and we, we got promoted on basically the adrenaline from the season before and just that togetherness that I probably haven't experienced ever since in any team so before or since that that togetherness because if we had got beat off Grimsby and went down the majority of them players wouldn't have had another club because a lot of them were unknown um, I wouldn't have had another club because I was 36 going on 37 um, the club would have went into liquidation probably started all over again because there was nobody running the club we had no owner there was a lot riding on it and I don't think everybody realised at the time what what catastrophic a catastrophic situation could have elapsed had we not stayed up I think the club would have just let's say gone into liquidation gone out of existence and maybe started again so many leagues below like we've seen over the years with, with some clubs and it w would have been an absolute travesty for this town and that team that went up that uh, stayed up that year gets applauded and, and absolutely because what it was probably the, ironically the catalyst for what's happened since because we got promoted the next season you know two seasons after that we get promoted again and if we hadn't stayed up what what if we probably wouldn't be having this conversation now how did you feel personally having that stand named after you in 2010 yeah it was it was it was strange because we were we were ready to travel to an away game my mind has me right it was away at I think it's Grimsby or something yeah I think it was Grimsby away and it was about half an hour before we were supposed to get on the coach because obviously we didn't get a flight in those days we coached everywhere whether it was Carlisle Grimsby or London it didn't matter and Eddie come to me and said oh um, Eddie Mitchell wants to go and see you in his office on the top floor I was like oh no what's going on no I can't believe this Eddie really Eddie Mitchell very rarely wants to see a player and Ed went to me, looked at me, and that's fine. I was like, okay, that, that gives me a sigh of relief. <laughs> um, went all the way at the top floor, came in his office and put me at ease straight away. He said, 
I want to name the North Stand after you. And um, I just looked at him like, yeah, you are joking, aren't you? And he, I think he knew what I was thinking. He went, I'm being serious. And they pulled out these plans for it and showed me it on, on, on this big piece of paper. And, and I looked at him and I was like, I don't know what to say. You know, you're honored, humbled, proud, um, welled up with tears. Um, he'd obviously spoke to Eddie about it before, so Ed kept it from me. I spoke to Eddie, he said, would you, be, would you be interested or words to that effect? And I was like, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I got back on the coach and Eddie said to me, happy? I mean, happy, I mean, what, uh, what word is better than happy? I mean, ecstatic. I mean, I, didn't, I couldn't say anything to anyone. I, I didn't know what to say. I felt a little bit, not embarrassed, but I felt a little bit like I shouldn't, I don't deserve it. I don't, why are you doing this type thing? And Eddie looked at me and he went, Biggin, he said, you deserve this. This is, this is amazing. And um, it took me a while to sink in. And I phoned my parents, phoned my wife, and we were all in tears about it. And it's probably one of the most honorable things that has ever happened to me. And to cut the ribbon when they, when they opened the stand and I would see my, my big head and my name above it was incredible. I took a lot of stick from it, as you can imagine, from my own players and obviously the opposition players I'd played against for years because I had about a seven or eight foot head of mine stuck on the top of the stand to start with and used to wind me up saying, do I have to keep looking up at that for 45 minutes? But um, it, it, it's something that, you never dream about when you're growing up as a footballer, you, you want to be a professional and you want to play at Wembley and you want to get promoted and you want to score a lot of goals. You never think of an accolade like that coming your way. And I remember Chris Temple on the radio found out that I was actually the only player in, well, we thought in English football history, but it could be in Europe that's ever had a stand named after them while they were still playing. Usually it's when you retire or you pass away. Um, I always joke that maybe they're trying to tell me something, <laughs> trying to make me retire. But I played for another three years after that. So that was 2010 and I didn't retire till 2013. But it's something I can't describe in words. Um, and every time, even now, when I'm in the stadium and I look up and I see my name, I just feel an immense amount of pride runs through my blood. And I still get people who come up to me now. And do you know what is brilliant? Because when we played in the Premier League, I had people like Mourinho and Pep Guardiola looking up at the stand and going, is that you? Is that you? How come? Why, why, why you? And they were like, and I had to probably tell them in 10 seconds, oh yeah, I spent a lot of time here in the club, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be on the phone to my parents saying, Jose Mourinho and Pep Guardiola's just asked me about my stand and crazy, because they probably come to these little stadiums and are interested in the history of the club. Um, and I've had a few moments like that and, and players as well. Like big players, top international players have, have said to me, oh, is that your stand? And you can imagine the, the, the pride and the, the love I have that flows through your body when, when something like that happens. It's amazing. Now, the Cherries finally got back into the second tier promotion in 2012, 2013. And then that June 2013, as you've said, a month before your 41st birthday, you decided to hang up your boots. Give us your emotions from that decision. I decided or... Ed decided. <laughs> uh, I, I hoped that Ed might just give me one more year. And we had a discussion. And because we'd gone into the championship, he's just like Fletch. I know you want to play. I know how much the club means to you. I know how much football means to you. I can't guarantee you being in, in the squad of like 18, 17, 18 on the bench every week. I can't guarantee you that the club is now in the second tier of English football for the second time in its history. I've got to be looking through other avenues. I'm, he said to me, I'm not telling you to retire. He said, because I know how much you still want to play. But I turned around to him straight away and I said, Ed, I do not want to go to another club. I've done it once. And looking back, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me, leaving and coming back because I had an amazing five years and probably played every game in them last five years like it was my last. I wish I'd done it in my first 15. <laughs> I might have been a better player, but... I said, I don't want to go to another club. I said, unless I was on 999 games, I said, then maybe I'd go and play one game. I said, but I don't, want, I don't want to leave. He said, well, look, I thought about it and I'd love you to join the recruitment department. We're a very small department. It needs building. Um, would you like to be part of that? I'd like you to like help run it. And I, I said, well, let me think about it. And after a couple of days, 
I'd got my head around retiring because obviously I went into his office hoping he was going to give me a year and I understand the, totally the reasons why he couldn't and it was only because he loves me so much and he didn't want to see me disappointed every week that I c couldn't be in the squad. He said, I just don't want to see your career fizzle out to nothing and not play a game or not be part of it. He said, but you'll still be part of it. He said, because when you're not off scouting, you can come to the games, you can be around the team, you can come out to training and... I spoke to Eddie Mitchell, he said, I want you to take an ambassador role on and, and look after the players and take them to events and represent the club. And after a couple of days, I said, yeah, I'd love to. Um, I remember going to the first game when I, was, when I was scouting and I went to Birmingham away and I sat in the stand and when they kicked off, obviously I'm, for the last 24 years of my career, or my life, I'd been part of that first game of the season. And that's when it hit me. Sat in Birmingham away in the stand with the rest of the scouts. I sat sat away from them, um, and shed a few tears because the realism of me not being a professional footballer kicked in on that day. Um, but I slowly got my head around it, and I think it helped being part of the setup here and being around the players. And Ed would get me into training in, in the sessions once a week. He'd shout me over. My office was over here in the main building, and he'd shout me over and text me and say come on big and get out on the training field I loved it um, I was at games I was going to games he was phoning me up I was liaising with him every day um, and I think being around it helped me get over the fact that I wasn't a professional footballer anymore because when you play for that long you just think it's never going to end I thought I was Peter Pan uh, I lived my life on and off the field like I was Peter Pan at times and you think it's never going to end the longer you play the longer you think you can play it's bizarre you don't think it's ever going to come to an end and I think it helped, helped me a lot going, staying at the club and doing what I did. Now, despite hanging up your boots, and I understand that you've been playing five a side still three times a week, but you've mm. got this vow that when you hit 50, which is this month, you're going to retire from five a side as well. Is that still the plan? Yes, I will play the odd charity game. And, you know, I don't mind playing a veterans league, but I'm playing with young lads who are 18, 19 and... When I retired, I still wanted to play. Um, so I went with my neighbor down to Little Down, played in a father's side with some young lads and they materialized from that. And then another group of lads said, oh, would you come and play with us? And we play an hour after that. So I ended up playing two hours on a Thursday, an hour on a Monday. But my knees are starting to take its toll. Now I never trained on 3G when I was a player because of my knees. I used to skip that day and have to go in the gym. And now I'm playing three hours a week on the 3G surface for nine years since 2013, probably 40 weeks of the 52 a year. Now I know my job isn't as, as important as it was as a player, but I still got to be out on that field. I'm still joining in training. I'm setting up training. I'm doing whatever the manager wants me to do. I'm out on the training field every day. Um, I can't jeopardize my job. And I said to my friends, I said, look, I'm going to retire. I said, my knees are starting to hurt now. Um, and it's like anything you know you've got to prioritise and this is my second retirement <laughs> I now know why I didn't want you to talk about that Grimsby goal because Zoe's going to ask you the next question Neil alluded to it there ultimate highlight of your playing career yeah the Grimsby game I think the goal but the game the, how pumped up we were the crowd going one behind equalising straight after half time um, through Feeney and then to get the goal and, and I, did, I have mentioned it since but I didn't mention it for many many years I actually thought I was going to score on the day and I never felt that really through my career I wish I had probably scored more goals but I had a feeling come over me when we equalised that this is my chance this is my moment this is why I've come back to Bournemouth this is why I've put everything at risk for the last couple of years of my career coming here 10 points adrift no one giving us a prayer club probably going to go out of existence and then got my opportunity in the 80th minute um my very good friend mark molesley always reminds me that he lost the header from the cross on purpose so the ball could drop to me and uh, it did not chested it down and just hit it as hard as i could and to see it fly in the roof of the net was the most incredible feeling i've ever had in my life and i'll never compare it to the birth of your children because you can't it's it's two totally different things but taking away the birth of my two daughters, Danny and Emily, it is, all right, my wedding day as well, I better say that just in case the wife's listening, but <laughs> apart from that is the most incredible moment. And like I said, Wem uh, Wembley was brilliant walking out and that buzz scoring at the Millennium Stadium, but this was on another level because of how much it meant to the club 
and, and what we'd been through and what I'd sacrificed and just the, everything that had led up to the game and then to score the goal, uh, I took my shirt off and run down the line and, uh, you know, and, and to believe that minutes before that, I kept thinking, I'm going to get a goal, I'm going to get a goal, I'm going to get a goal. Um, and then to get it, um, it was just the most, like I say, amazing feeling. Um, unless you've played football or a sport and you get that buzz. You've, I've scored goals in the last minute to win games and it, it's a great feeling, but it's hard to describe to people unless you've really played, like been in that environment and I'm sure we all get buzz from whatever we do in life, whatever job you have. But to score that goal and see the fans' reaction and what it meant to the club and saving us from getting relegated and probably going out of you know, everything. It was just like, it was just spine tingling and all the players jumped on me and the, and the photographs and the memories I've got from it. It was, people have said to me it was meant to be, it was written in the stars, I do believe so. Um, my granddad was a professional footballer, won the FA Cup, played for England and then he passed away just before I turned professional. And I always say to this day, he was looking down on me for that moment. Fletch, give us a five-a-side team of players you played with, not including yourself. Right, so five-a-side's totally different to 11-a-side. So sometimes the best 11-a-side players are not great at five-a-side. So, might not be what everybody thinks. God, it's hard to remember. So it's nine years since I've played. 30 years, 32 years since I started playing. Um, in goal, believe it or not, that's disrespectful, I shouldn't say believe it or not. Gareth Stewart, and the reason is he's so good with his feet. He plays five-a-side now sometimes in the staff games. He's just like a centre-half in goal. I know Mossy's going to be gutted and God rest his soul, Mark Ovendale and people like that and Jimmy Glass, although Jimmy never and not in a million years. <laughs> so Gareth Stewart, for the main reason he's so good with his feet, he'd, just be, like, he'd be like a sweeper in goal. That's, so he's going to be my goalie. I have to put Jermaine Defoe in because he can just score a goal. If we're getting beat, just give the ball to Jermaine. That's all I used to do when I played, just flick it on. He'd beat three people, chip the goalkeeper from 25 yards and I'd claim an assist. So <laughs> could do that in a five-a-side game. Yeah, Jermaine Defoe would have to be in there. See, I could throw people like Rio Ferdinand in because I played with him for a, for a month, but I think that's a bit harsh. Jermaine was with us for a season, so I ain't going to put people like John O'Shea and Rio Ferdinand in there because they weren't here long enough, so I, I can't do that. It wouldn't be fair to some of the players I played with for longer periods. I'll put Wade Elliott in there. It's tricky with his feet. So they're my two attacking players. I need someone to link the play, really, and that's Richard Hughes. Even now, he can't get the ball off him. It, yeah, I played five-a-side with him for a few years after he retired, and it's incredible. Just, just links the play, sees the pass. And at the back, you don't really need someone big and strong to head it. I know he's going to be devastated if he ever listens to this, which he probably won't, but I can't put Eddie in there. I know he wants me to, and he'll go mental if he listens to this, and I probably will tell him in the, in the next couple of days that I haven't put him in, uh, but I'm going to put in Carl Fletcher because he's so creative on the ball for a, for a centre-half, and he's brave, he's a leader. He, he would captain the team. Um, Play, listen, I could put I could put hundreds of players in there. I'm missing out some incredible players. Youngie, my best mate in football, Neil Young is going to be devastated when he hears this. Why am I not in there? Uh, Akuku will probably tell me that on his travels when I see him that why am I not in there? And there's some players like you, we, we spoke about earlier who went on to play at the top level. But I'm thinking of a five-a-side team. Don't need big, strong lads. You need quick, mobile, intelligent players and players who can score goals. So Carl Fletcher, Richard Hughes, Wade Elliott, Jermaine Defoe and Gareth Stewart in goal. Right, you can get some brownie points back with Eddie now. <laughs> he appointed you as first team coach. What was he like to work under? You, I know you had the scouting role first and then first team coach. What was he like to work under? I had the scouting role for two and a half, two and a half seasons. We went to an event to open up a, a doctor's surgery. I turned up out the blue because of being ambassador, that's what I did. Eddie didn't know I was coming. And although I seen him at least every other day at the football club, he turned around to me and we were having the picture taken and honestly put his arm around me. He said, Biggin, why don't you come over tomorrow and start doing more with us on the training field? Would you like that? I said, I'd love it. He said, you can still do your scouting. 
you st- a little bit, but just don't travel as much. He said, and come over. And it was amazing. I, and I just turned up every day and just listened, learned, watched, written lots of things down. Uh, did a few of my coaching badges. And that six months at the end of the season, I had a meeting with Ed and he said, enjoy it. I said, I loved it. He said, well, I loved having you around. Um, you showed loads of enthusiasm. I want you to stay on in this department and would you be happy I said absolutely it's the thing I always wanted to do but but you know looking back though when I did the scouting for two and a half years didn't have opened my eyes to a lot of things and you see players in a different way but the coaching was amazing and I've been now in that department for seven years since uh, I think it was obviously the January of our first season in, in the Premier League so seven years um, and I've learned a lot of things and I always say to players now I'm actually technically better with the ball at my feet than what I was as a player. Because when you're a coach, you have to be. Whether you're passing balls in or you're organizing, you're creating, you're whatever you're doing. I always say to players now, if you can do a bit of coaching in your career while you're playing, do it. Because you'll become a better player. You'll look at things differently. And I wish I'd done it at a younger age. And um, I've loved every minute. Working under Ed, he is relentless in every way. But... 99% 99% of it in a good way. Um, the days he did have a go at me, he'd always come to me at the end of the day and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. You know, I love you and I only say it because I want to get the best out of you. Um, he was He's intense, he's relentless, he's very methodical. There's nothing left unturned for him to fathom out and, and, and make sure that it's right. I remember him saying it was, you know, these little half a percent matter because at the end of the day, if everybody is half, percent, half a percent off it, it soon mounts up. And we always had two relationships, the professional relationship and the relationship outside of the stadium. So if we went out for a drink or went out for a meal or did whatever, that was my mate Eddie. Under this roof and in this environment, he was boss. And you know, that. That was something I had to understand very quickly, and especially around the players, because I couldn't call him Ed, I was calling him boss, Matt and Gaffer, whatever. Um, and we had two relationships, we did. Um, but he, he taught me so much, um, not only about football, but about life in general. Um, just his, his way, his demeanour, the way he thought about things. Um, I, said I could spend an hour just talking about how good he was, but I don't want to do that. Um, the proof's in the pudding. Look at what he did. Look what he did for this club. Obviously with Max and the people behind him, he built the club and he had a vision. Everything we see at this football club was Ed's vision, along with Max and the help that he had. But it's, um, it's an incredible journey uh, that I had in my career, but an incredible journey that I've had since I retired. And that's down to Eddie Howe, really. You had a brief spell as assistant manager to Lee Bradbury. Have you ever fancied a crack at management yourself? I thought about it. I've never, I've never said I wouldn't. Um, it's not something that's on, you know, at the top of my agenda. Um, I always think you're very silly if you turn around and say I'll never do it, because you just never know in life. Never mind football. Football can change in a heartbeat, in an instant. Um, so I wouldn't say I would never, but I have no intentions, and I'm not looking, and. I've had a few inquiries over the years. People have asked me would I be interested in going for an interview and I've just turned them down straight away because if you are, like, once again, like in my playing career, if you're happy, I don't want to change something. If things change and you never know in football, then you have to look at something. But at the moment, not, not on, my, on my heart of hearts, no, I'm not interested at the moment, but I would never say never because, like I say, you just don't know in football. Now... You were one of the few people that have been here this season and one of the few people that were here in the 2014-15 promotion winning season. How would you compare the two? So many people have been given so many different opinions on the two squads, the two teams, the two seasons. How, from your point of view... Would They're you two totally them? different. They're two totally different seasons. Um, Scott has been brilliant. I remember the first day Scott came in, I sat down with him and I said, look, I know you spoke to Neil Blake, Richard Hughes, about myself. Um, are you happy for me to be here? I said, I'll do exactly for you what I did for Ed. I'll give you everything. I'll be the same person. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be around the players. I'll look after things. I can organize, blah, blah, blah. He was great. Straight away, he said, Fletch, I'm buzzing. That's what I want. Um, I suppose that little link link between the, the staff and the players, etc. cetera. Um, 
But the two teams are totally different. That team came through League One, you know, started off in the relegation zone when Ed took them over in the October. Um, and we worked our way all the way up to the Premier League. And this team's a totally different team. You can't really compare it in ability. You can't compare in character. I think it'd be wrong to compare. I think they're both very hungry. That's all I would say. Um, I think Scott's done an amazing job to galvanise the players after the seasons before the season before's disappointment losing out against Brentford in, in the playoff semi final. Um, obviously, the, the previous to that, disappointed from going out the Premier League, and I, I still talk about it now. You know, the goal that never was it should never have been out the Premier League, and, but wait, it's happened as bizarre as it was, and probably never happened again in football. Um, so two very disappointing seasons or endings to seasons. Um, and Scott gripped the lads from the first day he came in, told them why we were doing extra running, why we were going to do extra fitness, why we're doing certain things. Because at the end of it, you, you'll, you'll get the success and you'll get what you deserve out of this season, which is promotion. And he said it from day one um, in front of all the boys. I remember the speech because it, <laughs> it was taking me back a little bit, actually. I was like, wow. Yeah, uh, he's been around, you know, 500 Premier League games, played for England. He knows what he, he's talking about. And um, I have to take my hat off to him and his staff. They've been incredible since they come in. It's different for me, obviously, because obviously I'm part of the old regime. But uh, for me, I'm still part of the football club. So old regime, new regime. It's still Steve Fletcher who's been here for nearly 30 years. Um, nothing changes for me for my love for the football club. And, and Scotty knows that. Um, Ed will Ed will always be my boy, of course he will, because he uh, he roomed with me. I watch him come through the through the youth team. You know, I roomed with him. He's one of my best mates. That's never going to be taken away. Ed's gone on to new pastures and done amazing. And Scott's done incredible with this group of team here. And I'm here, and you know that that's my part. And like I say, Scott and his staff have been fantastic with me, and and I've loved every minute. Um, both teams, like I say are different and it's going to be very interesting to see how how we um or how we achieve in, the, in in this premier league i think the team before there wasn't many players maybe apart from Artaburic the keeper who played in the premier league um this team has a few who've been there some who haven't so we've got a bit more of a mixture um but i know they're hungry i know they're desperate to, to succeed i'm sure and, it, and it's going to be a very interesting campaign um the teams will always get compared. You know this, uh, Zoe. The teams will always get compared from the first ever time we're in the Premier League with that team to the second time ever in the club's history in the Premier League. They'll always be compared. Teams always do. I think it's unfair, but that's what supporters love to do. You know, it's it's a talking point in a pub or a restaurant or sat at home with your friends, whatever. Um, I won't compare because I don't think it's fair. And I think it's it's very difficult to do that anyway. Just quickly, you touched upon it there. Scott Parker... What's he like working under him, working alongside him? A lot of people use the word intensity, certainly players when they're training under him. He is, well, listen, it's not the elephant in the room, but people are always going to compare him to Ed. One, because of what he's done, he's got us up. Two, because people see similarities. That, but you have to be around them to realise, yes, there, there's similarities as in, they're both, they're both very intense. They both make sure, and like I said, not a stone is unturned. Every bit of detail is important. But then the detail is different. I mean, straight away we play a different system the majority of the time under Scott than what we did with Ed. The way, the way we play is different a little bit. Um, yeah, we both like to keep the ball and blah, blah, blah. But the, the, ways we, the way we set up the... Not just the formation, just the way the, the way we the way we go out and and start the games, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You, you can look at detail and go, well, they're totally different. So I don't think it would be fair to compare them. People will, um, but Scott has been magnificent with the players. He speaks to them. He's a good speaker. He talks really well. Players listen. He's been there and done it, seen it, drank it, ate it, slept with it for so many years, and they know when he says something. This man has been at the very top. And straight away, he commands respect. The players look at Scott and go, yeah, I understand why you're saying it. Because you've been in around teams who've been at the top end of, of English football. Um, and with him and his team, they're very tight-knit. They're a, they're a group who've come from 
Tottenham and Fulham. Um, they've known each other for a while, but they, they came straight in and they're very open with everything. And, you know, Scott's door's always open like Eddie's was if you want to walk in and have a chat with him. And there's a lot of comparisons between the two. Um, but there's a lot that is very different. Fletch, we were all treated to some great footage of the gaffer at the end of the season in the changing room and stuff like that. Now, you said earlier about how he, he addressed everybody at the start of the season in the same vein almost. I mean, that must be a side of him that you've seen a lot more than ever, everyone else has. Yes, and uh, before every game, home and away, we always have a meeting that we talk about our set players, which we've obviously done throughout the week and how we're going to play. And then Scott does his meeting after that with the players and he talks about the opposition and then he usually gives a speech on what he thinks about the game and how he sees it and he's very passionate he's a very good speaker um, and sometimes it's not all about the game when he's speaking just before we come across to the stadium over in the players pavilion it's about things that happen in life and how he sees things um, and, and he, very much like Ed he's a, he's a deep thinker um, and he comes across really well. Like I say, when he talks, you, you are in the room and you, you do get a buzz. Sometimes I walk out that room with the players feeling, I want to put on my boots and go out and, and play for him and fight for him. Um, he gives you that, you know, that the hair's tingling on the back of your neck. He's, he's a very good speaker. Um, and I think the players have bought into that in their performances this season, especially towards the end when we were desperate and we needed them to perform. We all know what they were capable of. Um, and I think when when push come to shove, the players produced. Hopes for the season, Fletch? Uh, Champions League would be nice. Um, although I'm not really being picky. I mean, Europa League would be okay as well. <laughs> Listen, remember the first year in the Premier League, we were just thinking survival. I'm not saying we're thinking that now. It's a totally different situation. We've been there before. Um, but it has to be, it, in some respects, it has to be one of the things we have to think about. Survival, of course we do. Um, we will be, once again, the smallest team in the, in the Premier League. Um, but that sometimes works in our favour, and I think it did for the five years we were there. Um, my hopes are we achieve what we're capable of achieving. Um, you've got to work hard. We have a big motto across the floor in the changing room, work to win. Without work, you don't win. And um, we go and show all that this season. And who knows where we can go. Uh, you know, once again, staying in the league is, is paramount. But I'd like to think we're better than that. Now, we're coming to the end of our podcast. We always end with some supporter questions, just some spin-off questions, short and sweet. They've been getting in touch via social media. Um, we're going to start with AFCB in Germany. They always submit a question. They're brilliant. Um, they have asked, presuming your favourite Cherry's goal is the one against Grimsby, which we've talked about, what's your second favourite? Well, I'll tell you what, I won't, I won't talk about the one at, I won't mention the one at um, Millennium Stadium because I've already talked about it. That, that was great. But if it was just a league goal, I would probably say the goal when I was assistant manager when we played Bristol Rovers at home, it got us into the playoffs on the last game. Uh, Danny Ings took it round the keeper, squared it back, and I side-footed it home. And once again, it was another... Because we'd gone out of the playoffs and then we were back in the playoffs. And I remember the crowd all running the pitch, running away. I was 30, I think I was 39 years of age or something like that. And I never thought I'd have, a, I'd have another moment like that again. I think I'd come off the bench that season and scored a few goals. I was actually scoring more off the bench than when I was starting and I remember scoring that goal and that is my favourite moment because my favourite moment when you score goals is that the feeling and that spine tingling feeling and it's usually a last minute goal or a winner or in a big game and that was a big game to get us back in the playoffs and I remember that and ran down the line and once again with my shirt off and which I shouldn't do at 39 years of age but fans all on the pitch it, it was a, it was a great moment um, so that that sticks in my mind. Julian on Facebook wants to know, you're a northerner by birth, but, but does the South Coast feel like home after all these years? It does, and do you know why? Because every time I'm away with my parents on holiday, people always say to me, oh, where are you from? And I go, oh, I'm from Bournemouth. And my mum clips me around the head and says, no, son, you were born in Hartlepool. So straight away, I just say, Bournemouth's my home. And that's where I was born, but obviously it wasn't. I spent 20 years in Hartlepool, but I always... 
I always think of Bournemouth as home now. I've got a tricky one from um, Linda on Facebook. She's asking, should chips have gravy on them? 100%. Because Northern lads love gravy. Alex on Twitter, do you have a favourite tattoo and are you going to get any more? I am going to get some more. Um, probably more from memories because one of my dogs passed away, one of my sharp dogs back in uh, October and me and the wife were devastated again and I had a paw print from my sharp hair from before uh, with some nice words around it. I'm going to get the same done again for my dog, Missy. Um, my favourite tattoo is I've got a, a fallen angel and my daughter's initials and dates of birth around it. And I really like it. I always get commented on it on my arm. Um, so that's about my favourite. My, my tattoo is my left arm. I did my full left arm and it's all to do with my family. My right arm... I have I've filled about half of it, and it's to do with myself. So football, I've actually got the the date I scored the Grimsby goal on it. I'm a Leo, so I've got a lion encrusted into the football. Um, Fletcher Arrow, because Fletcher was an arrow maker back in the day. So I've made my right arm personal to me, and my left arm all to do with my family. Well, Fletcher, you've heard some hilarious stories. We've really enjoyed your company here on the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. So thank you so much for coming in and, and spending an hour or two with us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And let's look forward to the next 30 years. If you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, we would absolutely love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. We'd also be very grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, be it AFC Bournemouth related or the general football fan, can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Steve Fletcher and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle. Thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. (laughs) 